This is the life story of Mahatma Gandhi. Mohandas Karamanchad Gandhi is known as Mahatma, meaning the great soul. He was an astute political campaigner who fought for Indian independence from British rule and for the rights of the Indian poor. Gandhi's example of non-violent protest is still revered throughout the world today. In this video, we will talk about how this man of peace and representative of India's poor came from a privileged background and spent his teenage years as a rebel. Mahatma Gandhi was born in the northwest of India, in the princely state of Porambandar, on the 2nd of October 1869. In this picture, we see his family house. As we can see, Gandhi's family comes from an elite background. His father works for the government as the chief minister of Porambandar. His mother was a deeply pious woman who spends a lot of her time at the temple and on frequent fasts. She instills Gandhi with a strong Hindu ethic, with an emphasis on vegetarianism, religious tolerance and a simple lifestyle and non-violence. In this picture we can see Gandhi at the age of seven, the youngest picture we have of him. Gandhi's father decides to move his family to the nearby city of Rajkot. Crucially, schooling here is better and Gandhi is taught English. This is where his teenage rebel years began. At the age of 13, Gandhi marries Kasturba, a local go who is 14. Gandhi is a rebellious teenager, drinking, eating meat and womanising, yet he is also interested in self-improvement and is repentant after each act of vice. In the background we see the picture of Kasturba. When his father is on his deathbed, Gandhi leaves to have sex with his wife and misses the moment of his death. When his wife becomes pregnant and the child dies shortly after birth, he sees this as divine retribution. In the background we can see a picture of Gandhi's father on his deathbed. Gandhi later on gives a speech and comments on his father's death, saying, I felt deeply ashamed and miserable. I ran into my father's room. I saw that if animal passion had not blinded me, he would have died in my arms. Gandhi snaps out of his teenage mood and decides he is unhappy at Barvangnar College in Bombay and is offered the chance to study law at the Inner Temple in London. The elders of his caste tell Gandhi that he will be labelled as an outcast if he travels abroad, but he defies them and moves to London where he dresses in western clothes. Here we see Gandhi as a student in London. He finds kindred spirits in the vegetarian movement and the Theosophical Society who help him return to the traditional Hindu principles of his childhood, which were vegetarianism, no alcohol and sexual abstinence. Influenced by the society, Gandhi formulates his own ideas about the central unity of all peoples and religions. In this picture, we see the inner temple in London. Talking about the unity of all religions, Gandhi says, My young mind tried to unify the teachings, the Gita and the Sermon on the Mount. After graduating, Gandhi returns to India to practice as a lawyer although he loses his first case and is thrown out of the office of a British official. Humiliated, Gandhi accepts a post in South Africa, but when travelling the country he is ejected from the first class train carriage because of the colour of his skin. Here is a picture of Gandhi in South Africa in 1898. Appalled at the treatment of Indian immigrants, Gandhi sets up the Indian Congress in Natal to fight segregation and to develop the idea of self-purification and satyagraha, which means non-violent civil protest. He takes a vow of celebrity and begins wearing what he calls his mourning robe, a traditional white Indian dhoti. In this picture we can see many people wearing this traditional white Indian dhoti, or as Gandhi calls it, his mourning robe. In 1913, Gandhi organises a strike against a £3 tax on people of Indian descent. For the first time, he is leading working class Indians, agricultural labourers and miners. Building on his years of protest, Gandhi decides to lead a march of 2,221 people from Natal into Transvaal in his final act of public disobedience. 
Gandhi is arrested and sentenced to nine months imprisonment, but the strike spreads and the British are forced to drop the tax and release Gandhi. News of his victory is reported in England and Gandhi starts to become an international figure. This is the picture of the 2,221 people that are marching from Natal to Transvaal with Gandhi. Gandhi makes a triumphant return to India. He decides that he and his wife Katsurba should travel across the country in third class train carriages. Gandhi is shocked by the overcrowding and poverty. He encounters and vows to work for the disenfranchised. He calls for a day of protest against the Rowlett Act, which enables the British to imprison anyone they suspect of terrorism. In the picture behind, Gandhi and his wife Katsurba are shown in 1915. Hundreds of thousands gather in several cities, but the protests turn violent. In Amitsar, General Dyer fires on 20,000 protesters. About 400 people are killed and 1,300 are badly wounded. This massacre convinces Gandhi to start campaigning for Indian independence. The picture behind shows all the Indian campaigners campaigning for Indian independence and protesting for Gandhi, but the British turn guns on them. With his popularity rising, Gandhi becomes the main voice of the Indian National Congress and campaigns for political independence from Britain. Gandhi transforms the Indian National Congress from an elite group to a party of mass appeal. He wants to free India based on religious tolerance and acceptance of all faiths. Gandhi's calls for non-violent protest are embraced by Indians of all classes and religions. He encourages non-cooperation with British rule which includes a boycott of British goods. In the response, the British arrests Gandhi for sedition and as he is imprisoned for two years. And the picture shows Gandhi to rally in 1921. In responding to an article in a newspaper accusing him of hypocrisy, Gandhi says, I wear the national dress because it is the most natural and the most becoming for an Indian. Unable to ignore Gandhi's work, the British plan a conference in London to discuss India's future, but they exclude all Indians from the talks. Gandhi is furious and starts campaigning against Britain's salt laws which outlaws Indians from collecting or selling salt and force them to pay for heavily taxed British salt. The background picture is a picture of Gandhi giving a speech in 1930 about the British salt laws. One of Gandhi's most famous quotes though is when he holds up a handful of salt to the gathered crowd, saying, with this I am shaking the foundations of the British Empire. This is explaining how the British Empire relies on Indians to make resources such as salt, tea and others to sell and make their economy great, but leaving the Indians with little pay. He leads thousands on a march to the sea where the protesters boil up salt water to make legal salt, a symbolic act of defiance against British rule. He is arrested and the campaign escalates, with thousands refusing to pay their taxes and rents. The British give in and Gandhi travels to London to join the conference. The background picture is Gandhi leading his men to the sea to boil the salt as an act of defiance. Gandhi travels to London for the Round Table Conference as the sole representative of the Indian National Congress. He presents a powerful image wearing his traditional Indian clothes, but the conference is ultimately a failure for Gandhi. The British are not ready to grant India independence, and the Muslim, Sikh and other delegates do not ally themselves to him and do not believe he speaks for all the Indians. Gandhi's visit to England in 1931 wasn't a complete failure, as he is granted an audience with King George V and visits mill workers in Lancashire. These public appearances gained him great publicity and some sympathy for the Indian nationalist cause in Britain. Here is Gandhi's spiritual message to the world recorded on his visit to England in 1931. There is an indefinable, mysterious power that pervades everything. I feel it, though I do not see it. It is this unseen power which makes itself felt and yet defies all proof, because it is so unlike all that I perceive through my senses. 
it transcends the senses, but it is possible to reason out the existence of God to a limited extent. Even in ordinary affairs, we know that people do not know who rules or why and how he rules, and yet they know that there is a power that certainly rules. In my tour last year in Mysore, I met many poor villagers and I found upon inquiry that they did not know who ruled Mysore. They simply said, some god ruled it. If the knowledge of these poor people was so limited about their ruler, I, who am infinitely lesser in respect to God than they to their ruler, need not be surprised if I do not realize the presence of God, the King of Kings. Nevertheless, I do feel, as the poor villagers felt about my sore, that there is orderliness in the universe. There is an unalterable law governing everything and every being that exists or lives. Churchill liked to ignore Gandhi, and one of his most famous quotes about Gandhi was, It is alarming and also nauseating to see Mr. Gandhi, the seditious Middle Temple lawyer, now posing as a fakir. After his failure at the conference, Gandhi chooses to step down as the leader of the Indian National Congress and is sidelined from national politics. But when Churchill calls on India to support the fight against the Nazis, Gandhi is adamant that India should not come to Britain's aid while Indians are subjugated at home. Gandhi plans a non-violent protest demanding the British to quit India for good. In response, he is imprisoned along with his wife, Katsoba. Violent protests calling for Gandhi's release erupt across the country, but Winston Churchill is determined not to give in. Gandhi's wife dies in prison months before his release in 1944. Months before launching the Quit India movement, Gandhi says, We shall either free India or die in the attempt. We shall not live to see the perpetuation of slavery. And then finally, India gains its freedom. Unable to stop the strengthening calls of freedom, the British finally begin negotiations for the independence of India. However, the outcome is far from what Gandhi had campaigned for. The Mount Bhattan plan outlines the formation of the two new independent states of India and Pakistan, divided along religious lines. In the capital, Delhi, there were independent celebrations, but Gandhi's vision of a united India is shattered. The partition sets off mass mutual killings and the chaotic migration of 10 million people. Gandhi leaves Delhi, travelling to Calcutta to quell the violence by fasting to bring peace. This partition though creates more violence, and then Gandhi returns to Delhi to help protect the Muslims who have opted to stay in India, and begins a fast for Muslim rights. And then the unexpected happens. On his way to a prayer meeting at the Birla house, he is attacked by a Hindu extremist. He is shot three times in the chest. Other Hindu extremists celebrate for his death, but for most Indians it is a national tragedy. A crowd of nearly one million people line the route of Gandhi's funeral procession to the banks of the Yamanu River. Across the world, people unite to mourn the death of a global figure of peace, who never saw a dream of a united India become a reality. A hundred years on, and Mahatma Gandhi's actions in India are still being respected throughout the world today. In fact, a new statue of Mahatma Gandhi has been unveiled in London's Parliament Square to mark the 100th anniversary of his return to India to start the struggle for independence from British rule. David Cameron was present and described Gandhi as one of the most towering figures in political history. And finally, I leave you with this quote. In the midst of death, life persists. In the midst of untruth, truth persists. In the midst of darkness, light persists. <laughs>